Hello, everyone hears me? Good, okay. So I'll be talking today about lossless data compression. We're going to begin with some basic information theory, which is going to explain sort of quantitative limits on uh, how much we can compress data. Then we'll cover arithmetic encoding, a type of statistical encoding that um, is used in many uh, modern compression algorithms. We'll then I'll move on to a few practical um, implementation issues with arithmetic encoding. Then we'll look at prediction by partial matching, or PPM, which will uh, tell us how we can estimate distributions for random variables. So first of all, um, Shannon entropy. If we have some random variable x that has some distribution over some symbols x0 to xn, we can define the Shannon entropy as such. This is a quantity in bits that provides the content of our um, information. Uh, we cannot hope to, hope to achieve any better than this in terms of compression. Shannon's source coding theorem uh, says pretty much this. It tells us that if we do have several IID variables, all with the same um, entropy, then as we approach an infinite number of these symbols, we will approach an encoding rate that is the same as their entropy combined. Um, yeah. So arithmetic encoding is a technique that will allow us to achieve this optimal uh, compression rate. Uh, I'm going to assume here that we already know the distribution of the uh, variables we wish to encode. Um, the way arithmetic encoding works is taking this stream of random variables and encoding them all as a single number between naught and one. It does this by taking a naught one interval and repeatedly splitting it. It splits it into subintervals whose width are the same as the probability of the symbols. Um, we keep doing this, dividing and dividing our intervals, until at the end we output any number in that interval, and that's in arithmetic encoding. Here's a diagram of us doing exactly this. Uh, there's a table on the left, and you can see that I've given a uh, distribution for three symbols, A, B, and C. Um, we're going to encode the string A, B, C, B. So to begin with, our range is 0, 1. This is represented by this line here. You can see I've cut up the range 0, 1 by the probabilities of A, B, and C. That's 1 half for A, 1 third for B, 1 sixth for C. To encode the first symbol A, we're going to take our range down to 0, half. Then for a B, we take out this third here, which gives us 3 twelfths, 5 twelfths. And we repeat this until we finally come up with this. The uh, exact formula I've been using is quite simple. I've got L, um, L and U are lower and upper bounds. Uh, to calculate our new bounds, we simply take the difference, multiply it by the cumulative probability up until there. So for A, that's you know nothing, for example. And then for the upper bound, just one more uh, probability along i minus 1, i. And that's what we're doing here. After the end, we have to choose any number in this range. Obviously, the best number to choose is the one that has the least number of non-zero uh, digits. This happens to be this number um, that's between these two. Um, we don't actually need to send a zero, because obviously, between 0 and 1, we're going to have a zero point number. So this gives us information of five bits to send this A, B, C, B message. The problem with what I've just described is I've been performing calculations that would require infinite precision arithmetic. If you consider a file of several gigabytes, this is a really, really, really long floating point number, which is just not possible to do on modern hardware if we try to do calculations of that size. There is, however, a way of achieving roughly the same thing using only unsigned integer arithmetic we have a small sacrifice, however, in the compression rate we achieve. Um, a few observations, first of all. Uh, 
as our bounds are approaching each other, once, we have, uh, once the bounds match in their top bits, we no longer need to um, work with them because they're never going to change. So we could discard them and output them and just work on the following bits. Um, yeah. Also, we can actually afford to round our calculations as long as we don't end up having two values that would round into the same interval. Um, also, one does in fact equal 0 0.111111111. Um, this is just sort of a, a binary expansion, um, as long as this is obviously infinite. Uh, we're going to represent one like this, and I'll tell you why in a second. Uh, and finally, we'll replace our upper learn bounds with just k-bit integers. So we start by setting our upper bound to just 11111. This is, as we've said, equal to 1. We set our lower bound to 0. And what we're actually doing is, uh, is taking snapshots into our um, actual bounds. As you can see, there's implicitly an infinite number of 1s following our u, and also zeros from our L. And we're no longer considering any top bits that we've matched up, because they're not going to change from here on in. So we've just got rid of them. Whenever our U and L get a top bit that matches, we just do a binary left shift and, and output that bit. Um, this means we maintain quite a large um, range. The reason we've been writing our U's with uh, an expansion of ones is so that we know when these top bits match. If otherwise, we'd be comparing 1.000 to a number that was getting very, very close to 1, but the top bits would never match. Um, otherwise, we're still using this calculation here, um, just using integers rather than um, floating point numbers. Uh, one problem that I haven't uh, discussed, though, is underflow. Underflow is when our upper and lower bounds are starting to get closer and closer such that we risk uh, rounding that could uh, lead to lossy compression. Um, the solution to this is to look at how this could happen. The top bit of our upper bound will always be 1, and the top bit of our lower bound 0. They can't be the other way around, because that would imply our upper bound was higher than our, sorry, our lower bound was higher than our upper bound, which isn't possible. And if they were the same, we would have left shifted them away. So this leaves patterns looking like this. A 1 in the top bit of our upper bound, a 0 in the top bit of our lower bound, and then they get very, very close. There's lots of zeros in our upper bound and lots of 1s in our lower bound. As this goes on, they will um, approach to be as close as 2 to the minus k, where k is how many bits we have in our uh, integer, um, which is a real problem. If ever they got this close, every time we performed an encoding step, we'd lose data. The solution is just to throw our bits away. Um, because u will either move um, down to l, or l will move up to u, the only two um, bit patterns we'd ever output were 1 and then many zeros, or a 0 and then many 1s, which means we only really need to retain the top bit to know what the next few bits were going to be. So we take our bit pattern, we cut out all these zeros and 1s in the middle, and we make a count. The next time we output a single bit that b, we also output that count of the inverse of that bit, and then clear our counter. And uh, this equates to the same thing. And so if, if our counter is a reasonably big counter, we can then hope, we can hope to you know, cope with billions of bits of underflow, which is as much as we'd ever need to cope with. Um, and this forces our smallest difference between our upper and lower bounds to be about 0.01, which is significant enough that we won't have rounding issues. So up until now, I've been saying we have some distribution for all these random variables. But of course, these aren't always known ahead of time. Uh, yeah, so we have two options, really. First of all, there are static methods. We could just use a predefined distribution that both the encoder and decoder know and base all our compression on this. The problem is this will only work for a very specific set of files. Any files whose dis source distributions don't match would have terrible compression rates. And also, if we have a file that is made up of multiple different data types, only one could ever really be matched. Um, also, and again, another static method is to account for more files, we could just ahead of time count 
all the occurrences of symbols in the files, use these as probabilities, and then send in plain text this distribution to the decoder. The problem with this is, first of all, we have an overhead. We have to send this extra table of probabilities. And we'll also have averaging. If, again, if there's several different data types within the file, we'll, the distributions will all mash up into one large distribution. Solutions to this are dynamic methods. Dynamic methods start with a uniform distribution or, again, an agreed-upon distribution. But as they encounter data, they'll update their distribution. For every symbol they see, they change how they um, uh, model the data. Um, this gives us some form of adaption, which is useful. And again, there's no overhead with sending a table. The decoder, as it decodes, can uh, adapt in the same way. Uh, another assumption I made um, was when they said they were identically and independently distributed was that they were actually independently distributed. Here's a sentence for you all with some unknown uh, symbols to follow. So the decoder has already seen, and encoder have already seen these symbols. God save the Q. Does anyone have a guess? I tell you that each of these symbols is distributed as the English language. Anybody want to guess at what the next few symbols are? Hands, come on. One hand, it's 20 odd of you. No? Well, any of you secretly thinking to yourself, Queen, are wrong. But, um, <laughs> um, yeah, but um, the point I was trying to illustrate was that it was very unlikely, in fact, to be distributed at, um, as the English language. The English language would tell you it's most likely to be lots of E's. But, in fact, you're all thinking it's probably going to be Queen, which wasn't a joke. Um, but, yeah, sources aren't, in, um, aren't independent. We can look at the last few symbols to get a better idea. And the better we fix our distribution, the more compression we can hope to achieve. Uh, so I'm going to introduce to you prediction by partial matching. Prediction by partial matching does exactly this. It looks at the last few symbols in order to get a better estimate for a distribution. I'm going to use two terms, the order of um, PPM. That means how many symbols I'm considering previously and the context, that is, the exact last n symbols. Uh, and I'd like to note at this point, PPM isn't a compression algorithm as such. It's just there for estimating this uh, distribution. It's going to rely on another um, encoding step, like arithmetic encoding, um, to actually do the, um, the lifting work. And the way it's going to work is we're going to build a table for every single context. The table is just going to count occurrences of symbols. And we're going to use a probability equal to its count divided by the total count. So for each of these, it's a third, for example, uh, 1 over 3. Um, something we also have to deal with is how do we initialize these tables? We could initialize them to be uniform. But that's actually giving far too much weight to symbols we've never seen before. Um, because you won't see very many combinations, especially in such large contexts. So um, what we'd like to do is use a zero probability for things we've never seen before. But that would take away our ability to ever encode them. So we're going to add an extra symbol, the escape symbol. The escape symbol represents something we've never seen before. And we're going to output it every time we counter something we've never seen before. At that point, we then shrink our context from n to n minus 1. And then again, try to encode. And we keep emitting escape symbols until we reach a minus 1 order context, in which case we just use a uniform distribution. The decoder can follow these um, escape characters to know which um, distribution they're meant to be using. Um, yeah. The uh, counts we're keeping will increment counts in all of our um, contexts, even if we fail to encode a character, um, um, but not in lower order contexts if we succeed to encode at a higher order. So I have an example now for you all of um, PPM in action. We're going to encode the sequence ABABAC. ABABAC, ABABAC, yeah. And um, here we have some of the tables that PPM is using. So this is the order 2 table. This is the order 1 table. This is the order 0 table. This is our uniform order minus 1 table. Um, 
Just a note, there will be several order two and order one tables, one for each context you could possibly imagine. The context here is no previous characters, so right at the beginning of our sequence. And so what our encoder is going to do is going to look at an A and see, have we ever seen an A with this context before? We haven't. So fall back to, to um, order one, and also output escape using the order two table. Then we do this order one, escape using the order one table. We'll, we'll see we've never seen an A before uh, at all in, without any context. We'll escape at order zero, and finally output an A with order minus one. All these are being sent to an entropy encoder, which will be using these tables and the symbol in order to do its encode step. So onto the next symbol, we get a B. Uh, the tables now look like this. From last time, we incremented our A count by one because we, encount, we, we tried to encode an A at order zero. These tables now are, the, are different tables because our context is now nothing A because, again, we're at the beginning, quite at the beginning, so we can only really have one previous character. We've never seen a B at nothing A. We've never seen a B with previous A. We've never seen a B at all. And so, again, we're going to just escape all these tables until we get to order minus one. Something a little more interesting now. We get another A. We've never seen an A with context A, B. We've never seen an A with context B. We have seen um, an A at uh, the order zero context. So we're only going to escape from two and one, and then finally output um, an A at context zero. Our next one, a B. We have actually seen a B uh, with a context A. It happened back at the beginning. So we're going to only escape from our order two context, and then we're going to uh, encode using this one table. Next, we have an A. We have actually seen an A with our order two context. So we immediately output A order two. We will not increment any of these tables because of this, because we never had to fall back to them. Finally, a C. We've never seen a C at order two, never seen a C at order one, never seen a C at order zero, so we escape all these tables, and finally output our C at order minus one. So you noticed I was keeping a constant value for our escape symbol here. This choice was somewhat arbitrary. Uh, you can use many different values and many different uh, uh, compression schemes have. PPMD, for example, uh, uses a value that is equal to the number of non-zero counts. And the reason it does this is because the more new symbols you encounter, the more likely it thinks you are to encounter even more new symbols. And uh, other implementations simply choose to keep it as a pr constant proportion to the total counts. And really, uh, it depends on your input data what the best choice for escape is. I'm going to draw your attention back to the end of the last example, where we outputted these four um, characters at these contexts. The first thing we did was say, we've never seen a C in order B, A, which is true. We haven't. But we have seen a B. So put yourself in the decoder's position. You've just received this escape symbol uh, at order two. And you've been told, we've never seen the character you're trying to decode before. This means it cannot be a B. If it was a B, we would have encoded it here at this context. So is there really a need to have a count of two in the order one table? Because if it wasn't a B here, it's not going to be a B here either. So what this effectively does is reduce uh, this table to a 0, 0, 0, 1 table, which is a far better table to use. Again, when we go to our order 0, we say we've never seen this symbol before. But in fact, um, we've seen A's and B's before. It means by the time we get to order minus 1, it'll only actually leave us with a C, which means we can actually encode the C with no bits at all once we reach this context. And this is just um, something you can do to get a bit of extra compression out. Uh, so. And, um, a notion of how to put this all together. Um, you have um, PPM and arithmetic encoding working together. PPM will um, look at a single character, build its tables, hand a distribution and the character to the arithmetic encoder, and the arithmetic encoder will do one step of subdividing its intervals. On the other side, the arithmetic encoder will perform one step of um, producing a character, hand this back up to the PPM, PAPM will update its tables on the decode side and then give it back to the arithmetic decoder. And you'll do this again and again and again. A few remarks on um, PPM. 
for now, we've been using a, uh, a context that is um, uh, finite. We've said there is some n, start to n and descend. It's actually possible to have no limit on the context at all. Um, you just uh, build a tree-like structure with um, all the previous symbols you've seen and uh, just do a walk from the root down, edges being different symbols, and you can practically achieve an infinite order context. So if you happen to have seen this exact sequence before in the entire file, you can have the best possible um, chance of guessing what the next symbol is. And also there are ways other than PPM um, in general to find um, statistics. PPM makes an assumption of the Markov model that we only have to consider the last few characters to build um, a probability distribution for the current one. There are files that don't obey this law, and so there might be better ways of estimating for them. So a conclusion. Uh, we can quantize compressibility by using Shannon entropy. This uh, formula relies on uh, the probability distribution of random variables. And so there are schemes um, that can make direct use of this. And one of the ones we have discussed has been arithmetic encoding, um, which is probably one of the best encoding schemes, but sadly plagued by patent law. Um, that's it. Any questions? <laughs>